Hello there, welcome to a special edition of Literary Guys. I'm author Zachary Kellyan, here to read Ernest Hemingway's Indian Camp. We thought from time to time we would depart from our normal discussion of our book club to just read some works by famous authors for five, ten minutes, have a brief discussion about them, and just celebrate some of the wonderful English language works out there. Uh, fair warning to those of you listening, this is a story written in 1925, so some of the language is not only a bit antiquated, but fairly insensitive. I would say that we're reading this, one, because it's an important work of English, and two, it's actually fairly progressive for its time, even though certain terminologies may have gone out of favor and certain prevailing attitudes towards Native populations are no longer something we embrace today. Following this, we'll talk about what all the content means and how progressive Ernest Hemingway was being for his time and place. That said, some of the language that you're about to hear may be triggering. Without any further ado, here is Ernest Hemingway's Indian Camp. At the lakeshore, there was another rowboat drawn up. The two Indians stood waiting. Nick and his father got in the stern of the boat and the Indians shoved it off, and one of them got into row. Uncle George sat in the stern of the camp rowboat. The young Indian shoved off the camp boat and got in to row Uncle George. The two boats started off in the dark. Nick heard the oar locks of the other boat quite a ways ahead, them in the mist. The Indians rowed with quick, choppy strokes. Nick lay back with his father's arm around him. It was cold in the water. The Indians who were rowing with them was working very hard, but the other boat moved farther ahead in the mist all the time. Where are we going, Dad? Nick asked. Over to the Indian camp. This is an Indian lady there who's very sick. Oh, said Nick. Across the bay, they found the other boat beached. Uncle George was smoking a cigar in the dark. The young Indian pulled the boat way up the beach. Uncle George gave both the Indians cigars. They walked up from the beach through the meadow that was soaking wet with dew following the young Indian who carried a lantern. They went into the woods and followed a trail that led them to the logging road that ran back into the hills. It was much lighter on the logging road as the timber was cut away on both sides. The young Indian stopped and blew out his lantern and they all walked along the road. They came around a bend and a dog came out barking. Ahead were lights of the shanties where the Indian bark peelers lived. More dogs rushed out at them. The two Indians sent them back to their shanties. In the shanty nearest the road, there was a light in the window. An old woman stood in the doorway holding a lamp. Inside, on a wooden bunk, lay a young Indian woman. She had been trying to have a baby for two days. All the old women in the camp had been helping her. The men had moved on up off the road to sit in the dark and smoke out of range of the noise she made. She screamed just as Nick and the two Indians followed his father and Uncle George into the shanty. She lay in the lower bunk, very big under a quilt. Her head was turned to one side. In the upper bunk was her husband. He had cut his foot very badly with an axe three days before. He was smoking a pipe. The room smelled very bad. Nick's father ordered some water to be put out on the stove, and while it was there heating, he spoke to Nick. This lady is going to have a baby, Nick, he said. I know, said Nick. You don't know, said his father. Listen to me. What she is going through is called being in labor. The baby wants to be born, and she wants it to be born. All her muscles are trying to get the baby born. That is what is happening when she screams. I see, said Nick. Just then the woman cried out. Oh, Daddy, can't you give her something to make her stop screaming? asked Nick. No, I haven't any anesthetic, his father said. But her screams are not important. I don't hear them because they are not important. The husband in the upper bunk rolled over against the wall. The woman in the kitchen motioned to the doctor that the water was hot. Nick's father went to the kitchen and poured about half of the water out of the big kettle and into a basin. Into the water left in the kettle, he put several things he unwrapped from a handkerchief. These must boil, he said, and began to scrub his hands in the basin of hot water with a cake of soap he had brought from the camp. Nick watched his father's hands scrubbing each other with the soap. While his father washed his hands very carefully and thoroughly, he talked. You see, Nick, babies are supposed to be born head first, but sometimes they're not. And when they're not, they make a lot of trouble for everybody. Maybe we'll have to operate on this lady. We'll know in a little while. When he's satisfied with his hands, he went in and went to work. Pull back that quilt, will you, George? He said. I'd rather not touch it. Later, when he started to operate, Uncle George 
and three Indian men held the woman still. She bit Uncle George on the arm, and Uncle George said, Damn, squaw, bitch! And the young Indian, who had rode Uncle George over, laughed at him. Nick held the basin for his father. It all took a long time. His father picked up the baby and slapped it to make it breathe and handed it to the old woman. See, it's a boy, Nick, he said. How do you like being an intern? Nick said, all right. He was looking away so as not to see what his father was doing. There, that's it, his father said, and put something into the basin. Nick didn't look at it. Now, his father said, there's some stitches to be put in. You can watch this or not, Nick, just as you like. I'm going to sew up the incision I made. Nick did not watch. His curiosity had been gone for a long time. His father finished up and stood. Uncle George and the three Indian men stood up. Nick put the basin out in the kitchen. Uncle George looked at his arm. The young Indian smiled reminiscently. I'll put some peroxide on that, George, the doctor said. He bent over the Indian woman. She was quiet now and her eyes were closed. She looked very pale. She did not know what had become of the baby or anything. I'll be back in the morning, the doctor said, standing up. The nurse should be here from St. Ignis by noon, and she'll bring everything we need. He was feeling exalted and talkative, as football players are in the dressing room after a game. That's one for the medical journal, George, he said. Doing a cesarean with a jackknife and sewing it up with nine-foot tapered gut leaders? Uncle George was standing against the wall, looking at his arm. Oh, you're a great man, all right, he said. Ought to have a look at the proud father. They're usually the worst sufferers in these little affairs, the doctor said. I must say he took it all pretty quietly. He pulled back the blanket from the Indian's head. His hand came away wet. He mounted on the edge of the lower bunk with the lamp in one hand and looked in. The Indian lay with his face towards the wall. His throat had been cut from ear to ear. The blood had flowed down into a pool where his body sagged at the bunk. His head rested on his left arm. The open razor lay, edge up, in the blankets. Take Nick out of the shanty, George, the doctor said. There was no need of that. Nick, standing in the door of the kitchen, had a good view of the upper bunk when his father, the lamp in one hand, tipped the Indian's head back. It was just beginning to be daylight when they walked along the logging road back toward the lake. I'm terribly sorry I brought you along, Nicky, said his father, all his post-operative exhilaration gone. It was an awful mess to put you through. Do ladies always have such a hard time having babies? Nick asked. No, that was very, very exceptional. Why did he kill himself, Daddy? I don't know, Nick. He couldn't stand things, I guess. Do many men kill themselves, Daddy? Not many, Nick. Do many women? Hardly ever. Don't they ever? Oh, yes. They do sometimes. Daddy? Yes. Where did Uncle George go? He'll turn up all right. Is dying hard, Daddy? No, I think it's pretty easy, Nick. It all depends. They were seated in the boat, Nick in the stern, his father rowing. The sun was coming up over the hills. A bass jumped, making a circle in the water. Nick trailed his hand in the water. It felt warm in the sharp chill of the morning. In the early morning, on the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat with his father rowing, he felt quite sure that he would never die. Well, welcome back to the Stardust Lounge. Zach Kellyan here with Dr. Gordon McCallan. We just read Indian Camp. I would say if you just listened to that eight or nine minute recording, and you felt a little bit lost, don't chastise yourself. It's a difficult story to unpack. If you want to kind of have a leg up in the conversation I'm about to have with Dr. McAllen, what I would say is just a little hint, uh, go back and kind of give it a Freudian read. And if you want even a little more gentle nudge, pay attention to the cigars, and that will explain a lot of the story to you. So happy reread. Gordon, uh, I know it's been a while probably since you've dove into some of the earlier Ernest Hemingway stories. What'd you think of this one? Well, it's like a gut punch. Yeah. That the ending, which almost the, the, the final minute of the reading you did, could almost stand on its own. Like, it yeah. is a wonderful discussion between a father and son. And I, I think that that's really the, the part of this piece that, that speaks to me. Hmm. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of really deep context here. 
But the, the thing that really jumps out at me is the respect between father and son. Yeah. And the, the, the excitement and pride in the father's voice after having completed the cesarean. But mm. then also wanting to shield his son and his knowledge of the world mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. in the latter moments and, and regretting that he had seen the uglier side of medicine and of people. And, and that to me is, it makes this a, a very worthwhile piece to, to listen to. Obviously there's more here and I'm sure we're gonna dig into, but for me, and I think I've spoken about this on the podcast previously, is the notion of fathers inspiring sons in order to achieve and to have a place in the world. And this is really a piece about that in many ways. Yeah, it's. I, I'm really glad to hear your take on that because I think that that is one thing that I would hope anybody, even by a modern reading, you know, a hundred years after the story was written, I think they could hopefully see the nobleness and the gentle spirit of Nick's father and what he brings to the table. Now, are his attitudes completely woke by 2021 standards? Not really. I guess just to give you a little background, this is one of a series of what's called the Nick Adams stories. It's a character focusing on the young boy in this, from some of his earliest childhood memories on into his early adult years. These were written all in the early 1920s by Ernest Hemingway, predominantly up at his family's summer cottage in Petoskey, Michigan. So that's why the setting is in Michigan. Um, There were Native American and indigenous peoples uh, reservations and campgrounds out on some of the islands in the Great Lakes at the time. And so that's what he's referring to. And in the context of the story, Nick and his father were on a family vacation and someone came to their campsite and said, we need your help. So maybe his his attitudes and stuff might seem a little dated because they are, they're a hundred years old, but this is a man rowing in the middle of the night to save someone's life without any source of compensation or anything like that because it was the right thing to do. And I think while we could look at that now and say, yeah, some of his attitudes towards the native population isn't the best, this being Nick's father, I think Hemingway wrote him as a true and virtuous man who wasn't bigoted, even though he maybe used terms like Indian, which we now believe to be insensitive. So if my understanding of this piece is correct, that this was part of Hemingway's first folio of short stories, and that he had difficulty finding publication for that work due to the controversial nature of many of the pieces. You're absolutely right. I mean, things like childbirth were not written about quite so frankly in um, the 1920s, especially childbirth that also centers around a suicide and um, questions of parentage. Th- this, was, this was borderline smut for the time that it came out. Um, and it's interesting that he's really writing the Nick Adams stories and this story, Indian Camp in particular, as a parable for children. Um, he's, he's really trying to create a guidebook for young boys as they kind of navigate the world. And in this, these series, the Nick Adams stories, which you were correct, was his first folio of short stories that he ever published. You do see that kind of dynamic of the father kind of being the mouthpiece for what Ernest Hemingway thought masculinity should be. And uh, Nick kind of being the stand in for Hemingway as a young man trying to figure out the same crazy world we're trying to navigate today. Well, for those of you listening who may have tuned in to hear the reading of the short story, uh, here on Literary Guys, in our regular podcast, we do like to talk about the the good, the bad, the ugly of masculine portrayal and characters. And one of the questions we like to ask is, what can we learn from these characters? And so, Zach, what can you learn from the characters we see in this story? Well, I think I think you, you latched on on kind of the emotional heart of the story, is Nick's relationship with his father. But for me, what I really learn is I don't know that you will find an earlier example of both white privilege and um, kind of a colonizer mentality and toxic masculinity approached in the same story. And I, if, if you're new to the story, if you just heard it, if you didn't get that on the first read through, we'll kind of unpack it. The question that is left unanswered at the end of this is why did the father, the, the woman's husband who was on the upper bunk, why did he kill himself? And why is that? I will tell you why that is. Uncle George was the father of the baby. Oh, really? Uncle George, it's all very subtle. Hemingway kind of puts it in there almost like uncovering a mystery. Uncle George is handing out cigars to everybody, and he's very intimately familiar. He knows exactly where the shanty is. And um, this woman was impregnated uh, either consensually or by force from Uncle George, given how he treats her. We could probably assume Mm -hmm. the worst of him. The reason the father, the father, I guess not really the father, the husband of the woman who is in the upper bunk had a quote-unquote accident with his axe that was three days prior when she finally admitted it probably wasn't his child and that it was George's child. 
what you have here is Hemingway showing the contempt that Uncle George has for these people, the cavalierness where he quote unquote celebrates being a father but has no interest in you know, being gentle to the mother, no interest in raising the child of his own or anything like that. It's almost like a joke that this white man came in, impregnated this native woman, and then he's going to row a rowboat out the very next morning, and that's mm-hmm. all we'll ever see of him. And you see a little bit of what um, Hemingway, maybe not by today's standards, but certainly by the 1920s, was viewed as a very progressive champion of indigenous people's rights for his day. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he's trying to show here is kind of the disconnect of the village elders who want to stay far away from Uncle George and anybody associated with him. And then some of the younger men who are almost conspiratorial with him. They're laughing right along with Uncle George. You know, ha ha ha, you impregnated one of our women. Uh, you raped one of our women in the woods. Ooh, what a good laugh. And I think he's talking a really serious issue of, you know, if you talk to indigenous Americans today about the, the collaborators or the members of their own tribe who would deforest a land right along with the whites for a job opportunity, who didn't, that separation, right, right in the, the late 1800s when the story would be taking place, that separation between the traditional values of an indigenous society versus, well, this is the way of the future, so we're just going to become loggers, we're going to kind of embrace the white man's way. I don't know how he did it. If he did it deftly, that wouldn't be for me to say. But the fact that he's tackling that issue of colonization and he's tackling that issue of toxic masculinity in the early 1920s and doing so surreptitiously, most people who read the story wouldn't even realize it at first. To me, is worth talking about and pretty genius. Yeah, I, I would not have picked up on that. And I've I've done a lot of reading in my life. And, and it's not immediately obvious on, on hearing the story that that is what it is but it makes perfect sense and it's actually interesting without understanding that context one could almost look at this through the lens of you know what i think of a lot these days is the use of coded language Mm -hmm. and the use of dog whistles in order to say hey you know wink wink i don't want to explicitly say something racist but instead i'm going to use terminology that people know what i'm talking about and some of the language in there read through today's ears that you could actually interpret this as a little bit of a dog whistle story if it had been told today i agree but with the context that you gave and the time of the piece, it's actually quite the opposite of that. And that's, to me, really fascinating that we've almost inverted the roles of non-explicit language talking about things, Mm -hmm. that now it's like a rally cry to supporters. uh, What use, and what in this case had been actually a way in order to sneakily say something very progressive. Yes. And that's, I think that's one of the important things that I hope, you know, the listeners of Literary Guys are on the same page about us. I think it's important to read works, like you said, in the context of the time in which they're written, because it has a completely different read today than it would have read to those people reading it for the first time. Well, on that thought, I think we should wrap up this discussion. I'd like to thank everyone for listening to this uh, very special episode of Literary Guys coming to you from the Stardust Lounge. As always, I'm Dr. Gordon McCallan. And I'm author Zachary Kelly, and we'll be returning regular schedule next week with Chuck Polinick's Fight Club. Until then, this has been Literary Guys, signing off.